Hello everyone, my name is April Thomas. I am currently the Director of Historic Foodways for Nyshaps and the Historic Dills Tavern. If you're not familiar with Nyshaps, it stands for Northern York County Historic Preservation Society. We're located in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania. I am a 30 plus year food ways veteran. <laughs> I have been hearthside and cooking historic food for almost my entire life. Um, I'm also a graduated fashion designer who specializes in historic reproduction clothing, which means that I wear two rather large encompassing hats on one side. I'm constantly researching social history as it pertains to clothing and reproducing clothing for everything from um, reenactment to historic museums to individual individuals. And on the other hand, or the other hat, I should say, I'm constantly researching 18th and 19th century foodways as pertains to this region of Pennsylvania and American culture in general. If you're not familiar with foodways and what it means, in a nutshell, foodways is a term for the intersection of culture and food and social history. So people constantly ask me specifically, what does foodways cover? Well, foodways is um, really the teaching of understanding the culture through the food. So I spend lots of time at historic sites cooking interesting things and not so interesting, some rather relevant, interesting and fun foods so that people can understand what it was like to live and eat in the 18th century. Today, of course, I'm going to be speaking to you specifically about oysters and food culture in this region of America, specifically Pennsylvania foodways in the 18th and 19th century as regards oysters. Now, if you're anything like me, I love oysters, but I have to admit through my weeks of research specifically for this nice talk, I really did learn quite a lot more about not so much the history of oysters and how they were consumed, but about the oyster itself. So I thought I'd start out by giving you a few little interesting scientific tips before I get into the history of food and how oysters were eaten. I'm also going to be giving you lots of visual, um, visual references and things in this talk. I've chosen to give you a more live stream effect video than a heavily edited video because I'm used to speaking to large groups and crowds and I feel that a heavily edited video can sometimes lose a little bit of character. So I promise to try to keep your attention with fun, period correct visual aids and hopefully a little bit of wit. So thanks for joining me again and here we go. You're probably aware of the fact that a oyster is a bivalve mollusk, but did you also know that an oyster takes almost a full year to mature before it is available in the size that we're used to? And also, one female oyster can produce up to, get this, 100 million eggs annually. Have to say that in itself blew my mind. I didn't realize that you could have that many eggs out of one female oyster. But looking at the history of both colonized records and pre-colonized records, learning that one little tidbit of information made it all the more understandable to me as to why there were so many more oysters available on our coastlines and our waterways previous to colonization. Natives wrote, Native Americans have written and left us some documentation as well as obvious archaeological evidence of how many oysters were available and the prevalence of how where they were eaten and how many that were eaten. In the pre-colonized period, any of the archaeological evidence shows us that there are enormous amounts of discarded shells along any um, inhabited areas of waterways. And we know from 18th and 19th century excavations of colonized remains in America, specifically Pennsylvania, there are an enormous amount of discarded shells in privies and dug trash pits in the 18th and 19th century. What this tells us is that the oysters were very, very prevalent and very enjoyed. So we know that it was a common food stuff, not just from what was written and left behind, but what's actually left behind in the ground. Now, we might think that we have the best trash removal system in the world these days. And indeed, I'm not going to get into the politics of uh, I don't like to play our period is better than your period. In fact, I think every period, like any historian, has a lot to learn from another. And there is nothing new under the sun, unfortunately. Human nature doesn't really change. What changes is the, the clothing, the food, and sometimes the attitudes. But human nature 
no, it doesn't change. Most of the time when people are done with something, as in today as well, um, roadways or if roadways or anything to go by, people just throw it out the window, um, sometimes out the window of the house into the outside sort of trash pit. Um, sometimes they take it with them to the um, necessary and or what we would often call an outhouse and it ends up in there. So it's really interesting to find um, Today we can't really flush things as easily as we could in the past. So um, a lot of our trash has to be collected by modern methods because we can't really put it down a modern um, toilet. But in the 18th and earlier centuries, that is essentially where most interesting items end up. So you might think that oyster farming, for example, too, is also very new. But because if the colonists and everyone in the early 18th and 19th century had so many oysters, how did they not deplete the oyster breads right away? Well, eventually, between colonization and industrialization, our waterways become not only polluted, but also very heavily fished and farmed. So what we do end up with is some problems because of that. And essentially, oyster farming does become the solution to some of those problems. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Oysters themselves have always been enjoyed raw in any time period. Today, if you're anything like me, I like to have my oysters, especially raw oysters, with a little bit of cocktail sauce or a vinaigrette. But in the 18th century, there isn't so much of that that's documented. What you do see is a little squeeze of citrus fruit, which, believe it or not, yes, lemons and limes are available in colonial America. Like most things, in the past and in the present, if you have the availability because of location and also the expendable income, aka cash, then you can pretty much purchase anything that you would like. There is a very, very established network of citrus fruit importation in the colonial time period in colonial America. But oysters in general are just enjoyed on the half shell with very little to address them. Now, what's really fun about oysters and cooking oysters in regards to especially historic recipes is that unlike a lot of other foodstuffs, oysters can be cooked in a huge variety of, of ways. And in most of those ways, they're still very palatable. You can't take just anything off the shelf and cook it in about 15 different ways and find that it's actually edible. Whereas the oyster can definitely be done in this way. So for example, you can of course eat them raw, but did you know that you can pickle them, can them, steam them, fry them, broil them, bake them, smoke them, or broil them? Yes, and almost every way that you can cook an oyster, it's not only fast and effective, but very, very easy compared to a lot of other foods. Now, you might know that oysters are high in protein, but they're also high in a lot of really, really valuable vitamins and minerals, as well as, believe it or not, everything you've heard about the aphrodisiac qualities of an oyster, it's true. It's been scientifically proven now that there are quite a few chemicals in the average oyster eaten raw or cooked. However, raw has more of these um, elements, they trigger certain chemical reactions in the brain and therefore are technically considered aphrodisiac scientifically now. So yeah, very interesting. Um, you'll never look at an oyster the same way again. Um, basically in the 18th century, just like today, colonists and locals could get oysters at markets. They could buy them from market stalls. They could go to established um, fishmongers and different people and they could purchase them. Now you might say, well, how do rural people get a hold of oysters? The answer is by one of the preservation methods that I earlier mentioned. Most people in the 18th century are used to having preserved foods. There is a big common mis misconception, quite frankly, about any time period earlier than our own today being absolutely prolific with rotten food and that everything had to be highly spiced or coated, sort of disguised to um, hide the fact that it was rotten or not fresh. But let me tell you this, our ancestors were not stupid. Our ancestors had their own methods of both preservation and cooking. And trust me, the amount of knowledge that has been lost or just basically tossed aside and not used, however, maybe not lost, is legion. 
we are literally losing our food culture and our preservation skills and everything to do with primal cooking um, skills. <laughs> We're losing them on a rapidly evolving basis. So one of the things that I really enjoy about historic foodways and indeed teaching people and talking to people about the best that the past has to offer, which is a phrase I like to use, is that no matter what period you look at previous to our own, there is more skill involved in cooking and preserving food. The idea that previous or past areas or, or past cultures of food were um, highly spiced or highly um, uh, coded in order to hide the fact that they were um, either, you know, past date or disgusting is, is just total garbage. I mean, basically, we know less now about preserving food than they did. You do have a time in every culture that's called almost like the starving time. It's spring. It's when you have any sort of um, lack of fresh fruit, food because of the change of seasons. You've gone through the winter, you're heading into the spring, so your garden isn't ready yet, and you're living on whatever was left from the year before. That's a period where you do see some cooks get a little panicked about, you know, something maybe not smelling or tasting wonderful. The root cellar's getting a little bit bare. There's a little more <laughs> creativity in taking care of your family and cooking. But indeed, spices, things like pepper and nutmeg and even salt are much more expensive and highly prized and very sparingly used compared to today. Sugar, for example, is incredibly expensive and used very sparingly. The amount of sugar in your everyday or, or weekly diet is something like 1 20th to 1 16th as much as sometimes even just one day of the average American's diet. Yes, it's really that different. So basically, what I'm getting at is that in the 18th century, people had knowledge, they had the availability like we did, and just like today, what you ate was defined by usually two factors. If you could get it, and if you could afford it. And even if you couldn't afford fresh oysters, which sometimes in our region of Northern New York County weren't always readily available, you could always afford their counterpart, which was pickled or preserved in some way. In the 18th century, they were used more as an ingredient and a topping when they were preserved. When we think of oysters today, we think of a luxury, we think of going out and getting this wonderful plate of beautifully prepared, sometimes um, just covered in beautiful exotic things like shallots and vinaigrettes. But in the 18th century into the 19th century, oysters, especially raw, were street food. If you were in a region where they were easily available, such as a waterway that was right next to you in Philadelphia or in some areas of the Chesapeake Bay, then you could afford oysters, indeed raw oysters, on a regular basis. In fact, they were so prevalent that they were used as street food. In the 18th and 19th century, the most common form of street food was the oyster and a baked potato. Yeah, baked potatoes. Think of it as the equivalent of a hot dog cart in New York City today. So if they were cheap, why don't we see them in more, I don't know, more references? Why don't we see oysters everywhere? Well, the answer is, if you look hard enough, you do. In fact, an interesting point that I oh, that always gets a few laughs out of people, especially when they talk about um, wanting to know what the common person ate in the 18th century. In Philadelphia, in the 1780s, I believe it was late 1780s, there was a big deal socially and politically about the fact that the working class and the servant class and indentures were all really upset about the fact that they were being fed an enormous amount of oysters, shellfish, and believe it or not, lobster. Yeah, lobster. So I don't know about you, but I mean, if you were given enough lobster on a weekly or daily basis to be complaining about how you didn't want any more of it, that means it was probably pretty prevalent and available. And obviously it must've been cheap. Like most things, as soon as the availability of it becomes difficult or expensive or it's, it's just rare, the price goes up, the availability drops, and of course, the food culture changes as regards food. So in the 18th century, how are you likely to see oysters? Well, like I said, you're likely to see them on um, the street side in the cities. You're likely to see them as an ingredient pickled or, or preserved in some manner. And indeed, there are lots of references in the cookbooks of the day. 
When I reference a recipe, especially when I'm cooking at somewhere that's a little more rural than a port city like Philadelphia or Baltimore, I'm often looking at um, documentation from um, local people who would leave um, diaries behind, talking about what they would feed their family or what sort of food they purchased when they went to market. But there's also a very thriving and very, very prevalent book market in the 18th century. Just like today, there are celebrity chefs and they like to write books. They like to get money from writing books. Hannah Glass publishes The Art of Cookery in the uh, mid 18th century. And by 1805, it is very common in the average American household. Now, a lot of what I cook is what we would call tavern fare. Tavern fare in the 18th century basically means whatever the tavern that you're visiting or eating at has got for their daily fare. The menu has yet to be developed as we know it. When you arrive at a tavern or a public house, you're sat in an area according to your, sometimes your status and your gender, and you're given a meal based on whatever was available at the time. Generally, you didn't really refuse anything unless you absolutely hated it. It was considered a social rudeness. You just wouldn't do it. So you might find that uh, you might be served pie. You might be served some stew. You might be served a general average daily fare of an 18th century tavern. And obviously it would always be accompanied by bread. And you would just eat what you were given and then pay a modest amount to say thank you. That was the culture. In the 18th century, chefs were as happy to make money off cookbooks and try to inspire people to cook interesting things as much as they are today. So Hannah Glass had a huge profound effect on people and on the common food in 18th century America. Also someone named Mary Randolph who wrote several books. This is The Virginia Housewife, which focuses obviously on Virginia and the Southern traditions of America. And this is around in the early 19th century. Basically, before you have printed materials available to the everyday person, food cultures pass down between mother, daughter, daughter, sister, grandmother, daughter, you get it, so on and so forth. A lot of food culture is oral tradition and that will always be so. But what changes in the 19th century as regards oysters and food culture is really the amount of books available and also the change in industrialization and how it changes the cities, you have a huge boom in people moving in, makes colonization look like tame. Industrialization brings millions of people to America and it changes food culture almost overnight. The industrialization of basically Europe and America also has some consequences on the waterways. For example, you have a lot more pollution and a lot more issues with the natural waterways and therefore the oysters can pick up things like cholera, typhoid, and hepatitis as an effect. So in the 18th and 19th century, people were aware of certain types of diseases and how to prevent them. Even if they didn't exactly understand why or how they were happening, they often understood how to avoid them or how to treat them once they were acquired. Nothing like today, of course. I mean, hepatitis in the 18th and 19th century was essentially a death sentence, unfortunately. But hepatitis was very common um, by being when you consumed raw oysters in the 19th century if you had an infected waterway. So what you see is a change in the food culture at that point when you see more cooked oysters because they believe cooking the oysters could actually kill the pathogens within the oyster. And that's to some extent true. Although a little can get, you know, by without... Um, much trouble, but it is a much more effective way. Just like today, we would say on the bottom of any menu that cooking or consuming raw or undercooked food is um, going to lead to more problems. If you cook it, you have killed a lot of the, um, the, any of the diseases or bacteria or viruses or anything that's in that food, you're going to be much better off. In the 18th century, one of the ways that they would try to um, solve this problem or preserve food, specifically oysters, is by cooking them in what's known as pies or coffin pies. Yes, I did say coffin. This right here is a replica of a 17th or 18th century water pastry pie. Now, in the 18th and 19th century and previous, just like today, any type of fuel is actually precious. Doesn't matter if it's wood or oil, 
it costs money. If you haven't got enough wood on your property, and trust me, by the 18th century in America, they were having this problem. We think we're the first people to deplete our natural resources. Well, guess what I can tell you, we're not. In Chester County, in the late 18th century, there is documentation to show that people were traveling as far as Lancaster County just to get readily available firewood, and yes, they had to pay for it. Farming in colonial America, it involved cutting down an awful lot of trees. And although these people understood why forests and different sorts of trees were actually good for the environment, just like us, they wanted to build things and they wanted to stay warm. One of the things that then affected food culture was the availability or lack thereof of fuel. By the mid 18th century, the idea of baking more than once a week was considered taboo. You would have a wood-fired bake oven at almost every large establishment like a tavern or a large farm, and you would be doing your baking one day a week, traditionally on a Saturday. You basically fill your bake oven, or beehive as they're often called, sometimes squirrel tail, there's all different forms. Um, you basically fill your bake oven with a fire, and then you bake your bricks in order to bake your bread. By creating a fire inside of your bake oven, you are effectively heating up the bricks and baking them, and then they will hold on to a certain temperature for a certain period of time. So you feed your fire from early in the morning, and then you pull all the fire ashes and everything out of the bake oven, and then you spend the next six to eight hours as the temperature slowly decreases as the bricks lose their heat, baking absolutely everything you'll need for a week. So for example, at a tavern, where you have people coming through on a daily basis and they're staying and probably having multiple meals with you. You have to bake an enormous amount of bread to keep up with the desire and the need for the entire week. Bread was a staple in the 18th century. So this ingenious type of pie was developed in order to save fuel and preserve food at the same time. Now you're looking at this wondering, well, first off, where is the pan? Where's the dish? Where's the pie pan that it's baked in? Answer is, there isn't one. The really interesting thing about pies in this period, previous to the industrialized period, where of course industrialization leads to everything being available readily and for cheap, which has its good side and downside, of course. In this period, your pie pastry is what's known as water pastry. It's not made primarily with fats. It's made in a way that's almost like akin to Play-Doh. Yes, I said Play-Doh. Basically, the pie itself is just a vessel. What's important is that you've cooked and preserved the interior. The top will, in many cases, get so hard and crusted over that you basically have to force a knife in as if you were, you know, basically prying something off. You pop the top off and eat what's inside the pie. By making a pie like this and setting in a cold, dark place, such as a larder or a spring house, which are pretty prevalent in this period, you've effectively created a small, um, I wouldn't say refrigerator, but you've essentially created a small food preservation area to keep what is um, easily infected by, by food um, foodborne germs and illness. So inside this pie, for example, Coffin pies, as they're referred to, or standing pies, often are full of what is sometimes referred to as nose-to-tail eating. So for example, today, most of the things that especially Americans find unpalatable and would never eat on the dinner table go into things like dog or cat food. In the 18th century, they ate everything. It doesn't mean to say that you absolutely ate everything. And there's still, you know, the idea of someone not liking something is still normal. I mean, if you go somewhere and you actually literally don't like something, you're probably not going to eat it. Attitudes and income always affect how wasteful or not wasteful you are with your food. But even in the 18th century, some people didn't eat the actual pie itself. They only ate what was inside of it. So what did that say about the exterior? That it was just a vessel in which to encase and preserve your food. I imagine that if you were a traveler in the 18th century and had very little income, you probably ate your pie crust, and indeed there is some documentation to say so. However, if you're of higher status or higher income, you might be a little more cavalier with whether or not you eat the crust of something. For example, I love brie cheese, and I know in many cultures they eat the rind. 
but if I bake a brie cheese, I'm more likely to eat the rind than I am if I pull it out of the refrigerator or straight off a cheese board. The rind just isn't enjoyable or comfortable in its sort of uncooked state. Coffin pies are a very similar situation. Inside this pie, you could have anything from two to sometimes 15 ingredients. Coxcombs, they're pickled, yes, coxcombs. Oysters of all varieties. They could go in raw, they could go in pickled, they might be diced, you name it, they're in there. They also have things like liver and lungs, sweet meats, and other less desirable pieces of animal that today, again, would probably end up in dog food. This is the way that 18th century people viewed and preserved their food. And especially if you consider that when you fire up a bake oven, you have to bake all your bread for a week, as well as all the pies and everything else you would like to have for that week. This coffin pie is going to make a whole lot more sense when viewed from that perspective. Why would you waste wood and time and energy by firing it up more than one day a week in order to do all your baking? They were ingenious and they had methods. Although I have to be honest with you, I've made coffin pies quite a lot in my life. I never really feel that they totally encase the food. So I know that some part of 18th and 19th century food culture tricked themselves into believing that they were actually preserving things. And indeed it was probably safer inside the pie, but I have a feeling that ultimately, if this wasn't consumed within the first three days of baking, you're still more likely to get any sort of foodborne illness than not. So full marks for trying guys. To end, I'm just gonna to talk to you a little bit about pearls because who can talk about oysters without talking about pearls? So before we really get into that, having heard everything you've just you know, heard me spiel, basically you're probably thinking, all right, so oysters were readily available and everybody had them, but when did that really change? When did the food culture change as regards oysters? Because I mean, quite frankly, now if you go to a restaurant and you order a plate of oysters, it can be kind of expensive depending on where you go. Well, the answer, like I said earlier, is oyster farming. With the rise of industrialization in America and Europe, the waterways become polluted, but there are some good sides to industrialization. It allows more people to have more um, stuff. <laughs> it allows more people to have jobs. It allows more people to afford daily things that we're used to having now. It creates a much more consumer society in which people can live a higher quality of life. So when you have the change in waterways and you have um, less naturally occurring oysters, and of course people start oyster farming at this point, you see not only a change in the way that people consume oysters, but you also see a change in the way that pearls are viewed and whether or not they're affordable. By the mid 19th century, people had gotten away from eating so many raw oysters and had gone to other forms of fast food as we would call it, because the waterways were simply not um, they just weren't producing the amount of oysters. So fish farming as we know it, or oyster farming, is very, very prevalent. With that, in the early 20th century, the Japanese decided to try to, and indeed succeeded in perfecting the cultured oyster, or the cultured pearl within an oyster, essentially. That is why in the mid 20th century, characters such as June Cleaver are basically clad with both um, cultured or faux pearls. The change in the way that oysters are farmed changes everything. When oysters are seen as more cultured or more created or more farmed because they're not readily available, then you really see a change in how they're consumed. So of course now we are pretty good at, at cultivating and um, raising oysters in um, like in created beds. Sorry, forgive me. I'm trying to think of the best ways to say this. Um, we're used to having, we have the availability of oysters now, but they are farmed essentially in many cases. And so um, our attitude towards them changes. By the mid 20th century, with all of the introduction of low head dams across America and indeed all over the world, the way that oysters are farmed or gathered, or even the way that oysters are um, used to create pearls, it changes dramatically. In fact, all of the low head dams in America changed not only the, the oyster market, but it changed the shad market. Shad was a fish that was very, very prevalent in the 18th century, and indeed almost no 18th century 
reference to food in this area doesn't talk about the prevalence and the um, just prolific amount of shad that there was available. But of course, hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams and other things completely changed the waterways and how we not only um, hold natural food out of them, but how we use them to farm. So in previous generations or previous eras, people like Elizabeth I here would be clad in rare, absolutely unaffordable pearls that no one else besides royalty could even aspire to. To the 1950s when basically not only cultured pearls were available of all different varying degrees of course, you can still spend a lot of money as opposed to spending very little money, but by the 1950s in America the pearl represents not only the sort of um, post-industrialization boom and the um, availability of these sorts of things, but it also democratizes pearls in a way that I don't think anyone really saw coming. So it changes also our attitude towards eating oysters and our um, ability to be able to afford them. Farming oysters does make them, in some cases, more affordable. But culture has a big effect on whether something is popular or not. So, of course, once culture, a culture in general, any culture, sees something as common, it's, of course, not valued as when it's considered rare or endangered or, you know, something along those lines. So, of course, our attitudes to eating them are going to be, we're going to be more we're gonna pay more money. We're gonna be more excited to eat something when it's more rare and prized than when it's common. So our attitude towards the oyster has definitely changed a lot since the 18th century. I hope you found this enjoyable. I hope that you learned something new and I hope you'll look at both oysters and pearls in um, hopefully a different light, maybe more a fun light in the future. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about what I do on a daily basis, you can find me on Instagram at Fashions Revisited. And also my specific foodways page is at Fashions Revisited Foodways. You can also check out my website, which is www.fashionsrevisited.com. If you're interested to learn more about the Historic Dills Tavern, you can start by going on Amazon or any online um, supplier of um, digital video products, and you can check out A Taste of History, which we filmed last year with Chef Walter Stabe. Our episode is season one, sorry, season 11, episode one, um, a Seed of the City, which is all about the historic Dills Tavern and the food culture there. You can also feel free to email me, april at fashionsrevisited.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you for having me. I wish you all a wonderful, safe fall season. Take care.